Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here today with another episode of the Thriving Farmer podcast. Today, I am being joined by Michelle Patton, who is a lover of agriculture and business. She combines her passions through patent bookkeeping and consulting. She raises farm to table grass fed beef at Fighting Butte Cattle Company with her husband, Matthew. Michelle has a bachelor's degree in business administration and accounting from Montana State University Billings, where she graduated cum laude. She is a certified QuickBooks Online Advanced Pro Advisor and proudly serves on the Montana Farm Bureau Youth Farmers and Ranchers Board. She lives on the family ranch in Montana with her husband, Matthew, and two daughters, Lillian, four, Abigail, two, and son, Henry, who is an infant. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you, Michael. I'm so excited to be here. So give us a little bit about your background. Um, Did you always grow up on a farm or uh, what prompted you to come to the farm? Yeah. Yep. So I was raised on a farm or a ranch my entire life. We, I, my parents actually had a dairy farm when I was younger in Minnesota. And um, then I don't know, um, milk prices weren't great <laughs> in like the mid nineties. I don't know if people would remember that, but so um, we actually ended up moving to Montana to um, raise cattle instead, um, beef cattle. And so I've, I've been on a cattle ranch for, well now probably the last 20 years of my life and um now we live on my husband's dad's place and we we raise beef cattle now too okay and so talk to us about the the cattle operation um how many acres do you manage well actually it's close to um 15,000 right now what we manage between what we lease and own okay cool so talk to us about the bookkeeping side of things. I know that's what you focus on and that's what we wanted to talk about today was really just dive into like, you know, farmers are now at the end of the season, they're starting to look at their books, look at things that are going on. Um, how should farmers be doing an annual year in review? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I usually recommend that people, if they have the chance to try to um, look through I guess, look at their books, look at their financial statements on a monthly basis. But I realize for a lot of people, that's not even possible. I have clients who've been in the middle of harvest um, for like the last month and a half. So they, we haven't even met with them. We didn't even meet with them in the month of October because it wasn't even really feasible for them. So, you know, just as often as you can. But as far as the year end things, um, I think it's great to run a year-to-date profit and loss statement if you have some kind of accounting software. And if you don't, you know, just whatever method of bookkeeping you're using, just get that caught up through, you know, the end of last month and um, take that to your accountant or get get on the phone with your accountant and ask them if there's anything that you should be doing, you know, to prepare for taxes. It's always nice to kind of get ahead of the game. Um, and everyone knows their tax preparer is going to be very busy from now until so the end of April. So now would be a great time to reach out to them. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, kind of start thinking about 1099s because um, the deadline for that is January 15th to get your 1099s filed. And most farmers and ranchers would have some sort of 1099 contractor that they've worked with. So it's great to review that. And then, yeah, I think it's just it's just nice when you're actually looking at that profit and loss statement to, um, you know, think about at the beginning of the year, if you had any goals, did you meet those goals as far as revenue? Where were your expenses at? Were they um, more than what you expected? And if they were, kind of start thinking about how, you know, how you're going to manage that for the next year. Um, and I know a lot of people, too, are also working on renewing their loans this time of year or possibly coming up in somewhere between January and March. It kind of depends on your lender. So, so now's a good time to um, also get in contact with them. If you've got some kind of operating note that you need to get paid off and renew, Um, you know, just kind of see what you've got to do there for, for your bank or two. Absolutely. 
All right. So let's say some, someone who's a brand new to, you know, running their own farm book. So we actually have a, a fair number of those that would listen to this podcast. Um, talk to us through 1099s. Cause that's something, you know, when I started, I didn't understand what that was. And a 1099 is, is a contractor who's working with you. So you're not paying them like as a, an employee, but you're paying them for either, um, you know, like we pay labor jobs, 1099s, but also like someone who's doing like uh, work for you, like uh, maybe a, a plumber or mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So talk through that a little bit. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So um, yeah, that's a great question. So a 1099, like you said, it's a form that you send to someone who has provided um, a service to you for your business. So if it's anything personal, you don't have to worry about sending that. But if it's something that would be a business expense to you, that would be like the first criteria that this would have to meet. Um, the second would be, like you said, that they are not an employee. They are a true contractor. Um, so what what a true contractor is, it's someone who has, you know, control of their own schedule, <laughs> um, their methods, they usually have their own tools and equipment. So that's sometimes a nice way to know um, kind of how you can distinguish that between, you know, someone who really should be an employee. Um, and then the next thing that you need to know is what type of service do they provide for you specifically? Because, um, Basically, and I can kind of break down, I'll just sort of give you some examples of some very common um, types of 1099 contractors and yeah, that absolutely. farmers and ranchers work with. So, okay, yeah. So first, that one of the most obvious ones would be like farm labor. That's not an employee. So um, any, uh, you know, if you have someone who comes out and does some like machine work for you, um, machine hire kind of work. Um, branding, you know, I know around here, we've got a lot of ranchers. So if they've got a crew that comes out and helps them brand or do any kind of cow work, day labor, that kind of thing, that would be a contractor. Um, you'd also be looking at vet services. That's something that most people don't know that they need to provide a 1099 for. Um, and you don't have to include, um, like the cost of the vaccines and that type of thing in there, but you always can. Um, it, it's not going to be a huge deal. And, then some other ones would be like accounting and bookkeeping, legal services, um, any kind of repair work that has been done on your machinery. Um, rent is a big one too. So if you have a landlord that you're leasing land from, they would require a 1099. Um, and then kind of the next um, requirement or, or um, you know, what these contracts will have to meet is if you've paid them over $600 in the fiscal year. So from January to December, if you write them a combination of checks that equal to $600 or more, that's kind of the next requirement so that they would have to meet. Um, so you'd kind of want to, um, you know, make a list and de determine how much you've paid them. And then the last thing to kind of keep in mind is that, a corporation, if it's actually, um, you know, incorporated, they've got the, the ink after their name, <laughs> um, they are exempt. But you do need to provide them to sole proprietors and LLCs and even some trusts, just depending. And when it comes to the legal fees and the veterinary fees, you always need to send it them, even if they are incorporated. So there's a couple... <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I guess rules Aviats. that um, yeah. can, yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So that is so interesting. That is something I did not know that you needed the vets and legal is something that always needs to get a 1099. Yeah. Yep. All right. So talk to someone who, let's talk about basic bookkeeping. Cause I know in a lot of farmers, it, it, it mm -hmm. scares them to think about this. What are some, um, softwares out there that people can use? Well, let's first, let's break it down first. Why do you need to keep good books? I think, well, for me, I would say the biggest reason is it's just going to help you run your business better. You know, when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, you're a farmer, you're a rancher, you're a business person. Um, so in order for you to know what's happening in your business, how you can plan for the future, um, you know, maybe you can put away some money in savings or make sure you're paying yourself enough. You're going to have a very hard time doing that if you don't know what your financials look like. 
Um, so I think for me, that's the basic. Um, a lot of people would probably jump and say, well, so I can get my tax return done. But and that is important. You do need to do that. But that's really for me, not the priority. But um, and then the second one, obviously, would, would be when tax time does come around, you're prepared for that. And you, um, you know, don't get any surprises as far as um, tax liability and that type of thing. <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. I think obviously the other thing too is so you can track your 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 spending and like where you're spending your money too. Obviously, I like to do more of the mm-hmm. enterprise budgeting just in spreadsheets because I feel like it's kind of hard to manage all those aspects in like the financial software and spreadsheets are just so much easier to manipulate. But I think, you know, obviously mm-hmm. all your categories and, and that sort of thing is really important to be done in in the, in the bookkeeping software. Yeah, yep. Yeah, I, um, it's always nice to have really good categories and, um, you know, you can break them out fairly detailed depending on the level of detail that you want. It, it kind of depends on how much work you want to put into it. Um, you know, there is kind of a fine line between, you know, going a little bit overboard and you have like 500 accounts and you don't know <laughs> what, what a transaction is supposed to go to. And I think that also leads to overwhelm too, because, um, you know, people kind of get too concerned about making sure that everything is perfect. Yeah. Um, you're going to have a better, I think, a better experience with bookkeeping if you keep a little bit more general, at least to start with. And so you don't get so overwhelmed with wondering, is this right? You know, um, but the other thing, too, is with a lot of these um, accounting softwares, you can you can do a little bit more specific enterprise accounting by using different classes. Um, so that's what I do with a lot of my clients when they've got, you know, they might have a cow calf operation and then they might feed them out and, um, they might even have a small registered herd or something like that. So we're, um, keeping track of these things separately by using classes for each one of those two. Okay. So break that down for us a little bit. So a class would be something, let's say you're feeding, uh, three different cow herds grain, but you could break out which grain is going to which cow herd under those classes, correct? Yes. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, if you want to know what, how much you're feeding your, um, you know, your herd of, you know, bred cows versus what you're feeding your yearlings or something like that, we could have separate classes for each of those. And then the other thing we can do too is separate locations as well. So I find the locations are kind of nice for tracking field work. Hmm. Um, so if you've got, I mean, you know, everyone has <laughs> their fields have names. And so if you've got the, you know, the meadows down here or whatever, they, they it seems like everyone's got a name for everything. So we just will literally put those names of the fields in there as a location. So then you can actually, and then, um, as far as a class goes, when, it, especially when you're looking at farming, we would do like the crop. So mm-hmm. you would have your expense account would be, you know, the fuel that goes in the tractor, and then you could say, well, that went to the corn crop that's in this, you know, um, specific field. So you can kind of break it out even more specifically. Mm. Um, it's German. If, you know, if maybe one field is more productive than the other, what's the reason behind that? Something like that. Yeah. Just to give you a lot more data. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. Well, like I said, you know, that might be their bookkeeping or if they are planning on hiring a bookkeeper, that's something that they could pretty easily do, but I don't, you know, I, I find that sometimes it's just best to keep it simple when you're starting and then you can, you know, build upon your data and, you know, just get a little bit more specific information as you go along. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you mentioned too, of like keeping it a little more simple. So usually how many different, um, uh, lines do you like to see in a profit loss? For me, I would say about maybe Anywhere from 25 to 35, 40, you know, Um, and I can kind of list off some of the main ones that I like to always have broken out. But absolutely, um, when you're looking at your income, I always like to see income by either the crop or the type of cattle, you know, calf sales versus cold cow sales versus bull, Mm -hmm. cold bull sales, or if you're a, um, if you have a, registered herd, you know, your, your breeding bulls that you're selling. Um, and then, like I said, the different crops, it's always nice to have those 
separately in there just so you can glance at it real quick and see where you're at. And then as far as the expenses go, um, for me, I like to have your sort of like overhead expenses, which I call direct costs. Um, so fuel, any agronomy expenses. Um, so you can either have literally just an agronomy expense account or you can have some sub accounts, which would be like fertilizer or mm. chemical, you know, that type of thing. And then um, within the same category would be um, feed. So like I said, you know, feed can be one line. You don't have to break that out if you don't want to. And that sometimes just keeps it simple, <laughs> you know, have all the hay, all the, um, if you are, you know, doing mineral barrels, whatever, just kind of group that together. And then um, some of the other things in there would be like your supplies, your repairs and maintenance. So those can literally be one line supplies, one one line repairs and maintenance. Um, and then after that, you'd be looking at more of like your general and, and administrative costs. And so that would be office supplies, um, any of your like office related utilities. So I usually do telephone and internet in this general administrative um, category insurance, um, any of your professional fees, so your accounting, um, that type of thing. And then the third sort of, cate- you know, overhead category that I like to call it is, would be your facilities expenses. So that's your electricity expenses, any um, rent, you know, this one is pretty small, but you know, so, so for me, it's like, you know, you kind of have those three main categories and then outside of those categories is usually your advertising. Um, I usually put separate and then, um, any depreciation expense and, you know, I'm sure there's a few others, but for me, that's how I like to kind of categorize the main categories within, um, you know, your profit and loss. And then, You know, everyone's a little bit different, so you're going to have different expenses just kind of depending. Oh, and interest expense, too. I usually put separate Okay. um, outside of those other. Yep. Okay. And so let's talk a little bit. Actually, we'll talk to that in a second. Um, Going back to, like, the income. Now, for let's say someone who's raising, like, 30 different types of vegetables, you wouldn't recommend every single Mm -hmm. vegetable having its own, but you might break it out into, let's say farmer's market sales or, you know, wholesaler sales or restaurants, um, that sort of thing. Or would you do categories like greens and then maybe like tomatoes, if it was a big crop, is there a specific level of detail you like to see or a dollar amount? Yeah. Um, so, so that's a good question with people who are selling a, a large number of products, Um, What I usually recommend is they do more, they, they kind of do a little bit more tracking within their software on the products and services side of things where they're actually, um, you know, they have an, an actual item, a line item in their products and services that they, you know, have a, so I would definitely have each um, vegetable broken out in that side of things. So it doesn't, it, you can just choose, you can link it to any income account on the balance sheet. So as far as which income account you would choose, I think it kind of depends on the client. I know um, some of them who who like to do, um, just like you were saying, they like to have, you know, the um, on-farm income. So they like the clients who literally come to their farm and pick up, you know, for instance, I have a dairy client. And so they Mm -hmm. come to his farm and they pick up the milk from the dairy. And then, you know, so he likes to keep those separate. And then he also sells to, um, it's like a, a food co-op that he sells, um, some of his milk to. So he keeps that separate. And then, um, any, like you're saying, any farmer's market sales too, he keeps separate. Um, and I think that's mostly just a personal preference because you could also kind of cross-reference those with different classes and, um, you know, you can just have, like you were saying, if you want to do, you know, root vegetables or, you know, I don't, I don't know if that really matters so much when it comes to that, because you could process just a few different extra reports to know, um, you know, where your money is coming from. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so, okay. So let's talk now. We've got, we've got the, you know, the profit loss, they're running that and, and you a farm should run that once a month at least, right. To just see where they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then do you recommend them enter in bills once a week or once a month? How do you recommend people get to bookkeeping if they're going to do it themselves? Obviously there's the option of hiring someone, but if there's, let's say they're just starting out wanting to mm -hmm. do it themselves, how often should they be in the books? Yep. I think once a week is perfect. Um, you know, it leads to you building really good habits as far as bookkeeping. And plus, most people are paying their bills already, you know, probably about once a week, give or take. Um, so I think that since you probably already have a bit of a, um, you know, habit routine de developed around bill paying, it's nice to kind of move the rest of your bookkeeping tasks into that same routine. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think once a week is, is good because then you don't get too far behind. When people get too far behind, it leads to that overwhelm again. And then next thing you know, it's six months and they haven't even looked at anything. Um, mm -hmm. So, and also it's kind of nice because everything is still fresh in your mind. You know, you don't have to try to think of, oh, I went to two runnings. I don't remember what I bought or I can't find the receipt now or whatever. So um, that kind of makes it easier for you as well. And it makes it a faster process too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit here about the um, uh, funding the farm side of things. So I know you talked about like an annual operating loan. When, what different categories should folks be funding? So obviously you've got equipment that doesn't come out of a, a, a operating. What is that? That would be more come for just a, a one-off equipment loan, correct? Talk to us about like how you like to categorize those things. Yeah. Yep. So I, um, I think that it's always nice to um, for sure have those loans in your QuickBooks, you know, as an, as a liability. And when you enter that also make sure that you add that, you know, the asset that's um, involved. If it's, if you actually bought a piece of equipment, make sure that that piece of equipment is in there as well. Or if it's an operating note, then, you know, generally that's just, you're just transferring money back and forth. So I do think that it's important to have those balances in there. And, you know, if you're transferring money from an operating note, um, make sure that you're physically doing that in, in your accounting software as well, because then it will increase the balance of the loan and, you know, increase the balance of your checking account or whichever account that you're using there. Um, and then as often as you pay your loan off, um, once again, I think that it's important that you're entering that as, in, in, as well in there. And then also make sure that you're breaking out your interest. Um, you know, you'll always get like a year-end interest statement, but um, in order for your books to be accurate, you'll also want to break out that interest in there and then, you know, just compare those statements at the end of the year to make sure that they're correct. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that we, um, we, you know, when I, when we bought a farm, we ended up buying the property and we live here. So it's like the it was one, it was one mortgage, but do you recommend to people if they can separate the, the farm property and have the, the business buy that, or should they personally hold the property and then rent it to the business? You know, I find it's best, I guess, for the business to own the property. Um, and some people have two different entities you know they have the business the entity that owns the land and the entity that actually runs the business um and that's kind of just nice for um you know protecting yourself protecting your business um there is um i know there's like some homestead laws in in certain states i know we have one here in montana that if you do own the property personally, then um, you're a little bit more protected as far as, um, you know, your your land being able to be seized. But I don't think most farmers are as concerned about that as, um, you know, if there's some kind of lawsuit to get them against them as far as liability goes. And so in that way, I think that um, it's usually best to have an entity own, own the land. And that also kind of makes it simpler to... Um, you know, pass off to the next generation as well. Mm. Okay. So let's talk through that a second, because that's something that comes up is if the business owns the land compared to, let's say a person owns the land, that makes a huge difference for inheritance tax. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, I was just going to say, and it definitely depends on where, you know, the current laws and where you're at and everything. But I do find it's a lot easier to um, have a business trade hand that owns land rather than you physically inheriting, you know, personal wealth, I guess is how it's put. And so I, I find that you'll be taxed a lot higher, um, you know, in that inheritance tax when you know, you're personally receiving, you know, millions of dollars in land or, or whatever it might be. Mm, mm-hmm, absolutely. Back with another marketing tip is Cole Jones from Local Line. Cole, we are talking about online payments. Why should people be taking online payments? So, yeah. Hey, Michael, thanks for having me back. It's funny. We've done a lot of studying on this um, on farms that use online payments uh, versus farms that don't use online payments when they uh, have an online store. And uh, we've studied this across about 7,100 farms. And uh, what we can tell you (laughs) oddly is that if you use online payments as a a payment method to accept payment from customers, you get an average of 21% more orders each month. That's free money. It's free money. And I, you know, we, we sort of thought a lot about why is that the case? I, I do believe that Um, It removes some barrier uh, for the customer when they're purchasing as in uh, this, you know, online payment is a very natural and sort of accepted form of of e-commerce. And so there's a lot of confidence that you give the customer when they're able to actually just pay for the order right at checkout. Um, And so we, yeah, we we, we see a 21% increase in in uh, the number of orders. And uh, I mean, one of the biggest objections that we always get, I shouldn't say objections, I think one of the biggest concerns that farmers have is that extra 2.75% uh, credit card, uh-huh. right? And I think that uh, it's a very valid concern, uh, but if you're able to increase the number of orders that you're getting by 21%, you pretty quickly offset that 2.75% that you might be missing out on. Yeah, and any farmer that's operating at that close of a margin that they're worried about that, there's other problems in their business that the rest of this podcast will probably help them solve. Yeah, yeah, ab- ab- absolutely. All right, thank you, J- Cole, for coming on. Thank you. What are some common questions that uh, you get every single month as you're working with your clients about you know, kind of the bookkeeping side of things? Um, I think one is, and it's kind of just a small thing, but people are always wondering, do I actually need to reconcile my accounts? You know, because I work with some clients that we handle everything. And then I work with some clients who they kind of do the bulk of the bookkeeping and we just make sure that everything looks good. And so, especially on those clients, they, they feel like it's a waste of time to be reconciling everything. You know, they think they could be doing something better, but that is important just to ensure that you have accurate, correct books. Um, So on the bookkeeping end of things, I think that's the question I probably get the most. Um, And then in general, Um, I feel like a lot of my clients struggle with understanding their cash flow. And so um, I I work with them to help them to do, you know, cash flow projections too. Um, Because we all know with with farming and ranching, you usually get a big check a few times a year if you're lucky, if not once a year. And, you know, then you're trying to determine, okay, what do I do with all this cash? Do I, you know, have to pay off all my loans right now? Can I you know, hold on to some of it. So that's something that I usually kind of help my clients navigate as well is just knowing, um, you know, what, what happens with that cash and how do we kind of manage it throughout the year. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And talk through that too, because I don't think some people understand if you just pay down, like we're to pay down like a loan balance advance, that's actually going to hurt you on the tax side too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Well, you know, so so the thing with reducing a loan balance is that, you know, the only expense involved in that is the interest. So the only thing you'll be able to deduct is the interest. Um, if it's like an operating note, you've already basically made the deduction for all of the items that you've bought with your operating note, you know, all of your supplies, um, parts, whatever you've bought with that. So you're not going to get any additional tax savings except for the interest on it. Um, And, you know, even the same with an equipment note, you know, some, it kind of depends on your CPA and everyone does it a little bit differently. But for instance, when you buy a piece of equipment, you know, you can um, basically expense that or depreciate that all in one year, or you can break it out over the years. Um, You know, most are like five years, you know, over the, um, 
life of the the asset. And so just kind of depending on how you're doing it, that's already, um, you might have already completely depreciated that specific asset. And so paying on the loan, um, like, you know, it's the same thing. You, you still only get that additional interest expense as a way to reduce your tax liability. The rest of it is just um, reducing what you owe to the bank and it's not really affecting your taxes at all. Mm -hmm. And especially with the rate, well, it depends on who you have your loan through and what interest rate you're paying, but typically the interest rates right now are so low that it almost makes more sense to let those run and then just keep investing the money back into your business as long as you know you have a decent rate of return. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's so true. Right now, I mean, loan interest rates are so good that um, th th it is it is a you can take advantage of that and uh, like you said not have to worry too much about um excessive interest costs because um you know most operating notes most land notes right now are fairly low um the one thing i do see is that a lot of people are still using um a lot of these like revolving credit lines through for instance john deere financial mm -hmm. and those are still higher than what you're going to get through a bank. So that's something to think about too is, um, you know, can you kind of shop around a little bit and find a, a lower interest rate, um, you know, through a, through a bank rather than using those different lines of credits. I know that like, so John Deere's got one and I think even um, IH has one too. So there's just, a you know, some different options there, but um because those interest expenses can really, you know, add up if you're yeah. for using those often. So what what rates are those at right now, and what would you get it from a be able to get a, a like a revolving line of credit from a bank at right now? Yeah, so I mean, it, it kind of depends on those John Deere because you can get some like promotional lower rates, but they're very close to credit card rates, which might be fifteen percent, you know, oh my which gosh. is which is really yeah. quite high. Yeah. Yep. And so they, sometimes they have like promotional 0% or maybe only like 2%, 2.5%. But if you're just constantly adding to it on a monthly basis and you're not part of like one of those promotional purchases, it's actually quite high. With the average bank right now on operating loans, I would say like maybe 3 to 4% yeah. is pretty average. Um, you know, 5% would be on a pretty high side right now. So that's something to think about too. If you feel like you're paying on a high side of, you know, interest right now, now might be a good time to negotiate <laughs> yeah. with your lender. Well, I, I think we were talking this and people may be like, well, I'll just pay it off. And why do I need to keep that? But I think the thing is, let's say, you know, you have a, a piece of equipment. Um, I'm just going to use a, like a, for a vegetable farm because that's where I'm familiar with. But let's say you want to buy an undercutter and it's $2,500 and it will double the speed that you can harvest carrots with. Um, and you're like, okay, mm -hmm. should I actually take the loan out for that? And you know, you have, you know, um, usually it takes 40 hours or maybe it's 80 hours of man labor to harvest the carrots. Um, well, let's actually use something that's a little more real is this, this deck here. If you've got, let's say six people that are harvesting carrots for pretty much a week. Um, so that's maybe, maybe it's 150 hours of labor and you're paying out $15 an hour. Um, so 150 at times 15, what does that come out to be? Does that come out to be 2350? 2250. 2250. Oh man, off a hundred. <laughs> um, but let's put that, I mean, <laughs> that right there pays for itself. That piece of equipment, but almost pays for itself in just, uh, pays for 50% of itself in labor savings. If it cuts your labor down by half. Um, and mm -hmm. let's say, okay, so let's say you spent, uh, what did I say? Uh, $2,500 in that piece of equipment. If we at 5%, mm -hmm. and we finance that for two years, what's that costing us to basically borrow that money? Oh, it's, I mean, it's low. So 2,500. I mean, you're looking at like $5 a month in interest <laughs> yes. um, for that. So yeah, it makes massive sense to do that. I mean, we're looking at right now that a mm -hmm. greenhouse through uh, a USDA micro loan and, um, you know, just looking at the, it's a, you know, it's a, we're looking at a $50,000 note through the micro loan program and just looking at the amount of interest we're paying every single month. It's unbelievable. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's just yeah. so cheap 
to be able to uh, get that kind of uh, financing and just how much it can help you as a farmer. And I, I think the biggest thing that we run into when we work with farmers is it's a lack of confidence to think that I can actually make money mm -hmm. with something is that they, they believe farming is such right. a hard, hard thing that they won't get themselves financed properly. And when you're financed properly, oh my gosh, it just makes so, so much easier to, um, yeah to be able to run your and operate your farm. I mean, so like right here, we have, uh, we just bought our farm this year and uh, we actually haven't bought a tractor yet, um, like a, a utility tractor for it. We need to. Um, and we've looked mm -hmm. at the kind of what's out there, but so far we've been able to borrow one from a friend. And when you just have like a, a tractor that can move soil and, and compost and, and you know, do the, the tillage work that needs to be done, it just saves you so, so, so much time on your, your operation, you know, mm -hmm. hundreds of hours. So usually those, those make yeah. sure it's a good um, investment, but, you know, financing that can make a, a whole ton of sense if you know, you can make the cash flow back. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's something that I think people often forget. One is that labor is almost always going to be your highest expense. You know, if you're not doing the labor by yourself, most people aren't able to, you know, especially in something where it's, it, mm -hmm. it might be seasonal, but labor is very in labor. Labor is just very expensive, so that's going to be one of your highest costs. And the other thing too is, you know, what is your time worth too? Um, mm -hmm. Right, you know, you're you have to decide, you know, what's the best use of your time and um, how can you use it most efficiently. So, I I think that those are something that people. Um, often forget to think about and, um, you know, take into consideration when they are making these decisions, because they might feel like they're making the cheaper decision by, you know, just doing all the labor themselves or by just having people come or something. And um, in the long run, it really is, um, it's yeah. costing their business because they're, you know, they're just not using the best use of their time. Well, I think let's talk about this too, the opportunity costs. So, you know, let's say you're harvesting mm -hmm. those carrots in the fall and you literally have carrots, beets, potatoes, uh, all of those to harvest. And let's say because you're taking so long to harvest those crops, you end up leaving two beds or three beds in the in the field and they get ruined. You know, that's thousands of dollars mm -hmm. right there you lost because you didn't have the, the proper equipment. And with a piece of equipment, every hour you save um, is, you know, a, a, an hour, you're always going to pay for that time. So with a piece of equipment, after you've paid it off, it's just now free pretty much for your farm. So mm -hmm. labor does yeah. not come back. It's always an expense that's, that's, it's, it's never, yeah, never not giving you an ROI, like a piece of equipment that's saving you time is. Right. Yes. Yep. Exactly. All right. So we talked taxes. We've talked, um, you know, s some depreciation things about that. What other things do you think um, someone who's starting to farm needs to need to be thinking about as they're looking at this side of their business? You know, I I always like I will beat this into my clients, but <laughs> we always talk cash flow because that's that really is I find what can make or break a small business, and so that's like you were talking about when people aren't really confident enough to go out and try to finance something. Um, uh, just thinking about my clients that they have one, a little bit of cash reserves to fall back on, you know, whether it be cash in the bank or an operating note that they can pull out of. Um, and I also think that it kind of gives them a bit of motivation, you know, to know that they've got to, um, you know, pay that, you know, like you said, pay that piece of equipment off or pay, pay off that operating notes they've been using to um, fund themselves. But I also think too, that it's nice as you develop as a farm and, um, you know, you have more experience under your belt and everything, um, trying to find a way to um, cash flow yourself to a certain extent as well. Um, but that's so hard to do when you're first starting out. And I, and I don't think that farmers should feel like they are, um, you know, they're not successful because they can't just, you know, go out and, um, you know, completely bootstrap their business because that's just um, a very hard thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. So how many months reserves do you like to see farmers um, keep in their business? I always recommend at least three months and it seems like a lot. So, I mean, it's just a goal to have. Um, three months of your regular operating expenses. And if you can achieve that in 
you know, maintain it fairly consistently, then it might be a good idea to have six months, you know, and I know that that can be a lot of cash. Um, but it, it is also a peace of mind, you know, to know that if, if there's an emergency, if something comes up, you know, they've, they've got that as a sort of a backup plan. And then if you end up not using it, then you can, um, you know, pay yourself with it, you know, pull some capital out every, every few months as, you know, um, to pay yourself. So. Well, yes, too. And I think it depends on what type of business. Let's say you have a very seasonal business. Let's say you're a fall uh, corn maze. Obviously, you know that mm-hmm. you only have income coming in in you know, September, October, and maybe November. Um, if you're like a year-round hydroponic system that you know is, is shipping lettuce every week of the year, that's a very different cash flow situation. Yeah, yep. Yeah, that's very true. Um yeah, I and that's that's something to think about too. If you've got, you know, like a very retail oriented business that you are um, you know, consistently selling products and you know that you've got that monthly cash flow, it probably isn't as important. But the other thing too is you're you're gonna you're more likely to also have your monthly expenses, you know, that, that will always come up too and very um, rather than having more seasonal expenses, you're going to have very regular expenses. So um, I still feel like it's a good idea to have about three months if you can. Um, but um, more is not an issue. And if you feel like that just is so much money, you know, just add a little bit at a time. You know, if you can start with a month of of savings, that's a great place to start because that, you know, you know that if you didn't make any money for an entire month, you could still survive for the next month. That's a great feeling for people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Absolutely. Yeah. And I think too, looking at like what your expenses are of your business, let's say you have multiple employees, then you got massive expenses compared to someone who's just a solo operator. Mm -hmm, Yes. Yeah. All right. So let's just, uh, let's wrap this up. What kind of advice would you like to leave folks who are, you know, going ahead and uh, on their small farm journey and, and, and looking at the, the finance side and, and, and running scared, I guess, as I would say. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think that um, it just, you know, you just have to start. Um, it doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be perfect. You know, I think it's like, handling your bookkeeping is a lot, just like starting your business. Um, you know, you're going to make mistakes and you're going to be a little bit, um, overwhelmed, but, um, you know, start developing habits, start, um, creating systems for yourself. And also it always helps to have someone that's kind of, um, keeping you accountable. Um, you know, so if you're working with a spouse or a partner or something, um, you know, maybe you guys work on the bookkeeping together every single week and, um, you know, so it's just kind of a habit that you guys are developing. And um, the longer you do it, the better you're going to get, the more you're going to understand about your financial situation. And I think if you're avoiding it, it's probably because you're worried about what you're going to find out. And um, if that's the case, then you probably need it more than anyone. Because um, if you like have a bad (laughs) gut feeling about, you know, where your finances are at, um, they probably aren't as good as they could be. So just, Mm -hmm. you know, taking the time to acknowledge that and then, um, you know, saying to yourself that you're going to make it better and you're going to do that by, you know, being proactive about, about your bookkeeping, about your planning, about your budgeting. Um, I think that that's, that's going to be so helpful to you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. We really appreciate your time and uh, and just sharing with us all these aspects of, uh, of farm finance and just running books and that sort of thing. So thank you so much, Michelle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks for having me, Michael. I really appreciate it. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to, to listen to the podcast when it, when it releases. All right. Thanks for coming on. Looking to start or grow your farm business? You need a compelling farm plan that you can share with investors, convince your significant other with, or just to give yourself peace of mind. We have created a new program called the Start Your Farm Intensive. 
In it, you'll learn how to develop your farm idea to make sure you take all the factors into consideration for your context and your climate. You'll learn how to craft a one-page business plan that helps clearly define your target customer and lay out the necessary characteristics of your business. You will understand the three financial documents that every farm needs to fill out to make sure you are making money. And we'll give you all that as templates too. So you have the templates to fill out for your farm business. We'll also go through funding. So where to go for funding for the various stages and parts of your business. Starting a farm is hard. Starting a farm without a proven plan is almost impossible. Join us today. Go to growingfarmers.com forward slash start for more information. Now, what did past students have to say? Corey says, the exercises and spreadsheets helped me make the learning process easier and more real. Jenna says, I gained the support system and resources I needed for when I'm ready for the next step. And finally, the worksheets make you think out every aspect of the business step by step. Go ahead, join us today, growingfarmers.com forward slash start. Hey, Thriving Farmers, join me next week on the podcast as I interview Darren Babcock, who is the farmer at Bonton Farms and Bonton Community on the south side of Dallas. We talk about how we got started with the farm, the incredible social and community um, aspects of the farm, and how what they have done is use the farm to create multiple businesses in the area to help change their community. So join me next week, join a special interview with Darren. there you have it another episode in the books so i'd love if you would hop on over to itunes and leave us a rating and a review those mean everything to us we love to hear what you're thinking if you have a podcast guest that you can recommend please pop on over to the thriving farmer podcast website and leave us a review that's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com